Are we ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Everybody's so quiet. Welcome back. This is our second knowledge organization research group colloquium of the year and for the and our final one for the spring. Um, our guest is Melissa Gill. Melissa gave a paper last summer at the North American Symposium on Knowledge Organization, <clears throat> and that paper was outrageously well received. Everybody raised their hands and said, oh, that's the best explanation we've ever seen of cultural heritage like data. So we thought we would invite her to come here and talk to us um, about her work with the Getty um, vocabulary. I'm, I've been in this field so long that I remember when AAT was being planned. <laughs> Just an idea. <laughs> so, yeah. So, Melissa has a master's degree in library and information science from the University of Washington, and she's also finishing there a master's degree in art history, and she's an expert in um, digital art history and cultural heritage. So, I'm just trying to read. Well, first off, I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to be here today. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I'm delighted to share with you all some of the knowledge organization-related projects uh, at the Getty Research Institute. So cultural heritage information is inherently contextual, multilingual, ambiguous, and subjective. Knowledge organization systems have played an important role to mitigate some of these issues for gathering, for organizing, representing, and sharing cultural heritage information. With the digital revolution, and proliferation of digitized and born digital resources. Libraries, archives, museums are now considering how best to share information and resources. The Semantic Web purports to create a global, networked, and semantically rich ecosystem of data and resources. Knowledge organization systems have an emerging, emergingly crucial role to play in the Semantic Web and Link Data movement by enriching existing cultural heritage metadata and linking uh, between diverse collections. In this presentation, I will discuss two linked open data projects developed at the Getty Research Institute. My work as a digital projects manager for the Digital Art History Program. The first is the Getty Vocabularies, which are multilingual thesauri for describing art and architecture. And the second is the Provenance Index this uh, database pro uh, remodel, which is a data set of over 1.5 million records sourced from our primarily archival source documents for the study of provenance, history of collecting, and art markets which uh, in this project will incorporate the Getty Vocabularies as some data. So before discussing linked open data at the GRI, I would first like to contextualize some of the challenges when present when standardizing and sharing cultural heritage information. I define cultural works as art, architecture, and more broadly, both tangible and temporal objects produced by an individual, society, or group. Cultural heritage information can be contextual heterogeneous multilingual, ambiguous, interpretive, and dynamic. Cultural heritage objects are considered unique objects even when there are multiples. So, for example, there may be two prints printed from the same plate, but they are considered unique objects and typically described that way, particularly in museum collections. Knowledge organization systems such as metadata schemas and controlled vocabularies accommodate unique characteristics of cultural heritage information. The cultural object is often the center of cultural heritage information, as well as the activities related to the disciplines and domains working with material culture, which would include our history, archaeology, visual studies, and also museology, among many, many others. Such materials are considered unique entities, as I just mentioned, um, and typically cultural heritage information covers many concepts in addition to the object themselves, related people, events, locations, and um, conceptual ideas as well. Therefore, it's important for cultural object metadata to retain as much of the work's context as possible. So in this example um, of an early modern sculpture by Gian Bologna entitled <coughs> Abduction of the Sabines, you see here um, related concepts in addition to the object. So we have the creator, the creation location, the current location, the material it's made of, and depicted subject. So these are just some of the elements that are uh, used in a metadata scheme and describe the cultural object. Cultural heritage objects include, um, are diverse, so they include two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects, things that are uh, tangible, intangible, and mobile objects like buildings and arch architectural sites, and intangible fleeting things like performance pieces. And they can include objects that were created at some point but are no longer here. 
such as lost or destroyed works. So in this example, a Rococo table, an ancient Greek sculptural frieze, a mid-century modern house, and a photograph documenting French conceptual art are all pieces that are considered cultural heritage, although they're radically different, and can be part of the museum or repository holdings. Developing standards for describing these diverse forms of cultural representation can be challenging. What are their shared attributes? For example, what would be the dimensions for a performance piece? How would one record a culture as a creator as opposed to an individual? What types of information do you need to record a building location? Is it the city? Is it the street address? Is it the geospatial coordinates? These are all questions that we often ask in describing these objects. Cultural heritage information is multicultural and therefore multilingual. Um, in this example of uh, Paul Cezanne's painting, So Light with Apples, it's at the J. Paul Getty Museum. The descriptive metadata elements can have multiple fields when information um, that is either created or translated in several languages. So for, the, for example, this title, um, <coughs> Still Life with Apples, if it's been published in German, it would be, you know, pronounce that German, or in French, um, Nature Mort avec Pomme. So depending on how the work's been written about or contextualized, you have these multilingual terms um, for describing that. And multilinguality can affect the search and retrieval of information for the same resource if it's described differently. With the recent trend of federated information portals for accessing digitized cultural heritage resources across repositories, such as Europeana, the Digital Public, Library of America, and Art Store, multilingual metadata is becoming a central issue for access. These two Chinese spaces, although similar in appearance, are described using different terminology based on cultural and lingual distinctions. So the British Museum describes the vessel as the Moon Rose, and the National Palace of the Museum in Taipei describe, describes the vessel as Fensai. Both describe a type of enamel and style described as soft colors that were used in 18th and 19th century Chinese ceramics. Differing cultural and linguistic terminology can greatly affect access. <coughs> Searching each term in the image database in ArtStore with um, metadata, which is ArtStore is a um, image repository <coughs> with metadata records and images from different museums and visual resources collections can illustrate the, how different terms can complicate search results. <coughs> You can see here um, on the top, a search result for Fumi Rose brings back 73 results, Rover results, and a search uh, for Fensai retrieves uh, and displays four images. Um, so by utilizing a controlled vocabulary or the CRI to help power search, you could re retrieve all relevant resources. There can be amb ambiguity and uncertainty in cultural heritage information, which should be expressed in the data for the user. Creation dates for an object or dates affiliated with the sale or transfer of an object can be uncertain or vague at best. Often these dates mark, are marked qualifiers such as circa or about to indicate some uncertainty. However, this can be challenging when trying to structure and encode such ambiguity in numeric data. Creation attributions are another area of ambiguity. When attribution is unclear, qualifiers such as attributed or possibly by can be associated with the creator with the creator name. Peter Paul Rubens, for example, was a prolific Netherlands painter who had many royal and courtly patrons, um, in addition to a large-scale workshop of pupils and assistants that produced a high output of his work in the growing 19th, uh, 17th century European market. Consequently, there is often, um, or there can be ambiguity or uncertainty in attributing his paintings, whether they are to Rubens, to his workshop, or a combination of the two. So in this painting, which is The Wolf and the Fox Hunt, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, it's a credit to Rubens and his workshop, as he painted the wolves himself, but was aided by many assistants to complete the entire panel. And there were archival material that was able to, to um, make that claim. But otherwise, there can be an ambiguity in trying to ascertain who is, the, who is the creator here. Furthermore, there can be derivative works uh, produced by later artists, often described as copy after. In this case, the artist is known as Sir, Henry, or Sir Edwin Henry Lanzier. Um, but the use of a knowledge organization system can distinguish the works by identifying the creator artist, but also a structural relationship between this particular study and the source painting being copied by Rubens. So it's helping distinguish, but also unite together those related works. Subject indexing or applying textual data for describing what an image depicts is about is considered one of the most important means of enabling users to locate and access visual resources and information systems. The subject matter of a work is narrative, iconic, or non-objective, meaning conveyed by, by the work or the function. A 
of the object or architecture. Although subject in the indexing provides important access to visual cultural materials, translating visual to textual information can be very interpretive. Subject indexing attempts to balance specificity and exhaustivity. <coughs> Furthermore, subject indexing terms can be created for a specific user group or collection in mind. Therefore, aggregating subject terms in federated information systems can create complicated, redundant, and sometimes inconsistent metadata. In this example from our store, these subject terms were applied to, to visual sur surrogates of Jacob Lawrence's tombstones. Um, and you see here, there's some some um, related terms, 20th century, 20th century numeric um, characters. Um, there's also more contextual typological um, uh, descriptions such as genre and expressionist. So another um, attribute to point out is how um, this information and concepts and terminology can change over time based on new research discovered, such as a reattribution of painting or terminology that may become outmoded over time. So for example, Harlem Renaissance is the current term for the 20th century um, African-American movement, although historically terms such as Negro Renaissance and New Negro Movement have been used. The history of these changing opinions is valuable as historical information and should be preserved in some context, even if the terms are not displayed or um, in an information system. So preserving outmoded terminology, or at least for indexing purposes, can enable users to find resources that may contain or use antiquated terminology, such as in historical documents or sources. <coughs> These terms came from the um, AAT. The cultural heritage com community, comprised of museums, archives, and library professionals, has attempted over the years to work around these constraints to develop standards for structuring, describing, and sharing cultural heritage uh, information, cultural heritage resource information. Data structure standards, such as categories for the description of works of art for CDWA and VRA Core, are metadata schemas for describing cultural heritage objects and visual surrogates depicting those objects. They account for some of the complexities I've just articulated. And um, with the display and indexing of terms, date ranges, and qualifiers for language and types. Data value standards or knowledge organization systems, such as the Getty Vocabularies and Icon class, help standardize terminology and names across collections and provide structure for multiple terms for the same object or same subject. The creation and application of these uh, cre I'm sorry. The creation and application of these standards has helped with interoperability. However, the de development of the semantic web and linked open data initiatives may build upon these earlier efforts to <coughs> provide an essential framework for cultural heritage institutions to integrate diverse collections and enrich metadata. The semantic web, as an extension of the World Wide Web, aims to add a semantic layer of machine-readable standardized data in the web's, into the web's existing architecture. It aims to move the web from a web of documents to a web of data by adding a meaning of, of to, by adding meaning to data. Linked open data promises to make a connected network of information. Linked data uses standard web terminology technologies such as HTTP and the resource description framework or RDF for data representation and interchange. Linked data is open. When linked data is open, it's described as linked open data. When it is published explicitly with an open license for reuse. I'm just going to give a brief introduction or a brief description of uh, linked data. So I on the same page. Uh, the, the basic for linked data is triples. So triples express metadata as a statement with two entities. A triple is composed of a subject, predicate, and object. So um, in this example here, for um, Getty Iris or Getty. Vincent Van Gogh's irises at the Getty Museum. We have um, subject being the work irises is created by Vincent Van Gogh, the artist. URIs are used for concepts and relationships in triples. All concepts, both real world and abstract, are identified with URIs or unique identifiers that can be easily retrieved through HTTP protocol in order to be dereferenced or looked up. URIs replace strings of data or data values so that data can be machine readable. So the landscape of linked data has grown exponentially since Tim Berners-Lee introduced the concept in 2001. Uh, several museums have 
and libraries have worked towards publishing their, their data as linked data. And it's looking more at the cultural heritage museum world. There's been uh, several institutions that have worked towards this. The British Museum and the Yale Center for British Art and the Smithsonian Art, American Art Museum are several institutions that have already um, modeled their data to be structured in RDF and also have, have released their data through spark line points for querying and access. Um, Europeana Portal for Accessing Digitized Cultural Heritage across Europe has also published their, um, used the semantic model and released their data as well. And a newer project, the American Art Collaborative, which is a consortium of 14 museums with American art holdings, is working on a map, um, is working to map and convert their collection data as linked open data to develop best practices for expressing museum cultural object data as linked open data and also to create demonstration use cases that illustrate the value of linked data. So, um, the Getty Trust, which is composed of the Getty Research Institute, the J. Paul Getty Museum, and the Getty Conservation Institute, and the Getty Foundation, has recognized the potential of linked data in the cultural heritage field and has initiated over the past five years several linked open data projects across the organization. I, first, I would first like to describe the different types of data sets at the Getty to consider how they are conceptually different yet related. So here again, we have Vincent Van Gogh's irises, part of the Getty Museum collection, um, reference point. Um, first, there's collection metadata or records that would include descriptive metadata for the, the cultural objects. In this case, this metadata is from the museum, but um, the Getty Research Institute also has descriptive metadata records for their collection materials. Second, we have data value standards, such as the Getty vocabularies, um, in addition to local authorities and control lists. And third, we have research data, which uh, includes information about the cultural heritage objects and related activities that come from, that can come from archival documents or other sources. In this example of the research data, um, the data about the sale of the painting by uh, the M. Nodler and Company Gallery is found in gallery stock books, which is included um, in the GRI provenance index database. So while, um, although we are in the early stages of converting such data to linked open data, there is a potential to link across data, different data sets to enrich <coughs> metadata and allow cross data set search and browsing once user interface systems are developed to interpret and display semantic data graphs for users. So why linked open data for the GRI, for at least for the, the GRI? So there are several benefits that um, we identified so far for expressing our, our data as linked open data. So first, it improves accessibility by exposing and decentralizing data repositories. Second, um, it produces openly accessible data that is free to be used that is free to be used, reused, and redistributed by anyone in, in accordance to the Getty Trust Open Access Initiative. And this is part of a larger issue we have to release both our images and our data for openly, um, for open use and reuse. In addition, um, linked open data expresses the complexity and structure of semantically rich data sets that, um, at the Getty Research Institute in machine readable format. Um, in turn, LOD can facilitate resource browsability and discoverability by expressing data as linked semantic graphs that can be exploited by information systems to, to display visualizations and allow for browsing and related resource um, discovery. In addition, it supports multilingualism. So for example, creating language-specific URIs for different literals can produce structured and encoded multilingual data. In addition, using multilingual thesauri, like the Getty vocabularies, can facilitate access by using variant terms in other languages that are structured in, that, in this thesauri. In addition, um, value can, there can be added value or enrichment to data by linking to other data sets, such as linking to value vocabularies like I mentioned, the Getty vocabularies for related data sets, such as incorporating museum collection URIs into research data. So for the remainder of my talk, uh, I will focus on two linked open data projects of GRI. First, we'll talk about the Getty vocabularies. Linked open data project introduced the Getty vocabularies in the process to convert that data to linked data. And then um, I will also introduce the provenance index remodel project, which is a new project to, um, I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, convert this research data into linked data. So 
So, um, as, as Richard mentioned, the gay vocabularies um, started in the 1980s as in response to the cultural heritage documentation community's need for controlled vocabularies. And the J. Paul Getty Trust began the program to develop these thesauri for the cultural heritage domain. There are currently three vocabularies that fall under the umbrella of the Getty Vocabulary Program. The first um, being the Art and Architecture Thesaurus, or AAT. There's the Union List of Artist Names and the Thesaurus for Geographic Names. Within each vocabulary, unique concepts are represented by individual <coughs> records, which contain terms, notes, dates, sources, and other information about the concept. One preferred term or descriptor is used as a default term to represent the concept in online displays. So the Art and Architecture Thesaurus includes generic concepts for describing art, architecture, and other information related to art, architecture, conservation, archaeology, and material culture. The union list of artist names, the structure of vocabulary containing names and biographical information, and, in, and also references for artists. But in addition to artists, we also include other, both individual persons and corporate bodies related to works of art. So that would include patrons or owners, galleries, museums, um, corporations are there as well. So it's a named entity that's, that can be related to the cultural heritage realm. And the third and largest vocabulary is the thesaurus of geographic names, which contains names and other information for current and historical inhabited places, geographical features, and archaeological sites. The Getty vocabularies are fasted in thesauri in compliance with ISO and ISO standards for thesaurus construction. They share a core data structure, they map to a common schema, and are interconnected technically as well as semantically. Unlike subject headings, the Getty vocabularies are true thesauri. The terms and records are linked through equivalence, hierarchical, and associative relationships. So for example, in the AAT record for the, for the concept rita, which rita are drinking vessels often shaped like an animal horn used in ancient Greece and the Middle East, uh, includes equivalence relationships for riton, rayons, rhea, including multilingual translations. The concept record has a hierarchical relationship to the parent concept drinking vessels. And it also distinguishes from the related but different vessels to rank up. The vocabulary's polyhierarchical structure also allows for concepts to be linked to multiple parents. Thus, one concept may appear in multiple hierarchical views. In this example, Rita falls under two additional places in the object's facet, under vessels, with containers by form and ceremonial containers within containers by function or context. The Getty vocabularies are multifunctional. First, they serve as data value standards or sources of terminology for cataloging, documentation, and tagging. Second, they serve as knowledge bases for information lookup. And lastly, as tools for facilitating online search and retrieval of resources. They are also multilingual. There are full translations in Spanish and Dutch, and we also have German and Chinese translations that are underway thanks to partnering institutions. The Getty vocabularies can now be exploited in new ways for information retrieval and discovery with their release as linked open data. Making the vocabularies available as openly accessible data aligns with the Getty Trust Open Access Initiative, which I mentioned earlier, and also supports the growing number of museum and library data sets being published as LOD. The AAT and TGN were released in 2014, and ULAN was published about a year ago in 2015. All three vocabularies are published under the Open Data Commons Attribution License, openly reusable. So first, to release the vocabularies as linked open data, the Getty technical team, so the, the Getty vocabulary program is structured with an editorial team, and then there's a, a technical team. Um, and the technical team first mapped as much of the data as possible to existing standard ontologies such as the Simple Knowledge Organization System, or SCAS, for representing thesauri information, Dublin Core for common properties, the bibliographic ontology for sources and contributors, among others, for data that could not be mapped to an existing standard ontology, and the examples are guide terms and term flags, and parts of speech as well. Uh, the Getty technical team developed a specific ontology called the Getty uh, Vocabulary Ontology, or GVP, 
So together, this ontology stack taken as a whole creates the complex semantic representation of the Getty vocabularies, expressing the, the data's depth and richness. So try and use as many of existing ontologies as possible to represent the, the terms and then um, building the, the custom um, ontology to represent those terms that couldn't be represented in existing ontologies. The data are described using the principles of RDF and URIs to identify the name and location of data in the, in the vocabularies. And the data sets are published as linked open data on a semantic web by the Getty Vocabularies Linked Open Data Service. Um, they are available in several RDF-based formats um, and accessible through the URL vocab.getty.edu. The Getty Linked Open Data Project capitalizes on the vocabulary's existing semantic and linked structure. For example, an artist record in ULAN contains TGN concepts for birth, death, and active places. So the vocabulary were harmonized together, and they were always conceived conceptually as harmonized, but um, the Linked Open Data Project um, motivated or, or um, caused the, the vocabulary to be linked um, both technically, also technically, by merging control lists that were existing with separate vocabularies and, and harmonizing those. <clears throat> and linked open data, the Getty vocabularies are expressed as structured and openly reusable machine processable data that information systems can interpret and use to create semantically relevant relationships across other linked data sets. The vocabularies can now be linked to many data sets being published by libraries, archives, and museums using URIs. The SORI authority files and taxonomies described as value vocabularies in the semantic web domain play a crucial role in the success of linked data by acting as hubs using these URIs, URIs in place of data values or strings to connect concepts, names, and works across data sets from different communities. So leveraging semantic control vocabularies and authorities to enhance cultural heritage metadata is essential if the semantic web is to fulfill its promise of creating an interconnected, discoverable information ecosystem. Multilingual semantic vocabularies also hold the potential to enrich existing metadata and support the search and browsing of resources describing different languages. Many cultural institutions and repositories <coughs> working within data stress that linked open, interoperable, and multilingual vocabularies are vital for increasing access. So um, currently, the Getty Research Institute is undertaking a new project to restructure and convert data in the provenance index databases to linked open data. The project aims to exploit the Getty vocabularies for the purposes just as, as I just described, and to potentially exploit in applications uh, for displaying and interpreting linked data as human readable information. I'm going to briefly introduce this multi-year project, which is in its preliminary planning stages. So the uh, Getty Provenance Index, or GPI, is a set of databases that contain over 1.5 million records taken from primary source documents that cover Western art, European art from the 16th to mid 20th centuries. The records primarily track inventory holdings, sales of paintings, for sales of its inventory records and sales of paintings, but also includes sculpture and, and drawing as well. Um, the data supports research in the fields of provenance or the study of ownership, in addition to the history of collecting and art market studies. So for example, um, in, for the history of, or for the study of provenance, interest in the history of the object, so it's kind of the change of ownership over the object's life cycle. So interested in both the moments in time in which you can track where it was held in particular inventories by owners, but also moments of in sales catalogs where you see an object come up for sale and you can transfer it at the moment at a particular moment in time when it changed hands. The index was originally created in the 1980s as a print publication, or a series of print publications I should say. And um, it has been described as one of the earliest digital humanities projects. Um, a relational database called Quadrastar was used initially to manage the, print, the publication data, and now is the information system for entering, maintaining, and accessing GPI data. The LOD mapping project is one component of a larger project that includes creating a new information system with user interfaces and APIs and provide, uh, in addition to provenance data standards and use cases to demonstrate digital humanities driven scholarship. 
From a data perspective, there are several motivating factors for initiating this project. First, there are eight separate databases that make up the provenance index, distinguished by both source material, which includes, as I mentioned, sales catalogs, inventories, and dealer stock book books. But they're also further divided by nationality, such as French and German. So the French sales catalogs are in their own database. The uh, German catalogs are in, their, in a separate database. There's all, um, and so there's currently no way to access all the data at once for, for searching or downloading. There is also a lack of standardization across the data sets, although they were built roughly uh, using the same data model. Each model has slightly different elements based on the source material. So a single authority file, so in addition to that, a single authority file is used for artist names um, across the databases, but there are separate authority files for different types of people. So um, artist authority, there's a single authority for artists, but then there's a separate authority for owners, which includes buyers and sellers of works. So there's an opportunity to harmonize those um, different um, authorities. The data is multilingual, and it's, it is often difficult to search information in different languages. And in addition, provenance index data is inherently event-driven and relational, with people, corporate entities, owning and transferring um, objects over time. So moving to a, more, a semantic data model will help scholars and art historians working with com computer-based methods to analyze and visualize relationships and networks found in portions or in, um, over the entire data set. The data mapping and conversion of this project will be iterative, extracting the data from the current system, mapping to the CDOT conceptual reference model, cleaning and standardizing the data, linking to value vocabulary, such as the Getty vocabulary, um, and most likely other external vocabularies, and converting the data to RDF and triples. Revisions to mapping, cleaning, and linking will be revisited throughout the development of the infrastructure for accessing the data. And the, the infrastructure will include UIs for searching and visualizing and exploring the data, along with APIs or an endpoint for large batch downloading and advanced querying. Further revisions will happen as the data is published and exposed um, in response to feedback from the community. So we see this as a very iterative process, um, continue circling back to the mapping and the cleaning and the linking as we expose the data. So this project is using the CDOC CRM model, which is maintained by the International Council of Museums, an international standard. Um, the the CDOC CRM is an event-driven ontology that provides comprehensive semantic representation for cultural heritage information. It articulates historical, geographical, and conceptual information that can enhance cultural heritage metadata. Um, the application of CDOC CRM offers a framework to preserve both the richness specialization of provenance index data while also harmonizing it with other linked data from cultural heritage institutions um, using this ontology. Um, as of now, and as far as I know, the British Museum, the Yale Center for British Art, the J. Paul Getty Museum, and the American Art Collaborative, in addition to the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, are all using CDOC as a base ontology for the <coughs> open data project. So we are interested in using an existing ontology, but also working with, um, we're looking at what other cultural heritage institutions were using. The ontology is event-driven, meaning that concepts, places, and people are associated with events throughout the object's life cycle, such as creation, exhibition, transfer of ownership. Um, so all of those related concepts kind of branch out of particular events throughout the object's life cycle. <coughs> so um, this is a very small example with work title you would um, create, it's representing the same market model with triples where you have a man-made object which is a uh, class, E22, connected to a property which is, has title, and then E35 is another class which would describe the, the literal irises. <coughs> so mapping the provenance index data to the CDOC CRM requires a different data model from, from a relational model which relational tabular data to semantic or RDF model that leads to graph structured data. <coughs> so I'll give you a um, kind of sample or an idea of sort of what this transition means. So in, in this example, you can see a page from the M. Nobler and Company Gallery Stockbook. Uh, it's, it's book 11. This is held at the Research Institute. We're 
which is the source material for data that has been described and added into the provenance index stockbooks database. The gallery, the Nover Gallery maintained records of inventory of, of works of art that both entered and left the gallery, which includes dates of entry and dates of sale, object titles and other descriptive information, individual and corporate bodies both buying and selling paintings, in addition to other end prices as well, so the prices of um, purchase and sale. And this information is, um, everything in the books is, is handwritten, so instead of doing OCR, which we've done for some other projects, um, this was transcribed by, by an editorial staff. As you can see below, so this is the archival kind of source material, and then this is the current web display for um, the Providence Index, displaying a record for a single entry taken from the stock book, um, in, from book 11, which shows the sale of, uh, uh, Edward Manet painting. It's depicting the family, uh, Monet's family in a garden. So since the prelim preliminary data mapping is currently in progress, I've included here a possible mapping of select fields and, uh, for the pro from the Providence Index to the CDOC CRM using the record I previously um, illustrated. So you can see the kind of drastic change in, in organizing um, its knowledge. So the semantic meaning is expressed in the relationships between the concepts and values for this painting. Um, and what is key here is the, the, the organizing around events, because it's an event-driven ontology. So concepts, people, dates are all grouped around uh, events, in this, in this case acquisition, since, since the source material is really about the transfer of ownership. Um, so the transfer of custody from previous owner to a new owner, and this is broken down into two events, two acquisitions. So you have the, the kind of previous <coughs> owner, Albert Ulrich, sells to Nodler, and then the new acquisition where Nodler sells to Joan Whitney Payson. So you can see the connection of the kind of one one actor between these two acquisitions, and then the the creation, who is you know the Manet is the creator, and that would include also the um, creation date and the creation place if you have that data. We're working with source materials, so we only have limited information based in that um, archival document. So even though we're in the early stages of mapping, um, we found several challenges with translating the provenance index data to CDOC CRM. So first, there's a larger conceptual issue, which is what are we mapping? Is it the object? Is it the document? Or is it the event itself? And this decision impacts how the data is mapped, both how and so how it is mapped and how, how it's modeled and mapped, but also how the data will be enriched and what data we will um, include and build upon. The CDOC CRM is designed to represent and share cultural heritage information, such as museum collections data. <coughs> but that often, those institutions often don't publish provenance or financial information um, to the public. So the CRM does a very good job at identifying the kind of transitions over time where an, an um, object moves from one owner to another, but there aren't properties and classes to describe prices. Specifically, museums don't publish the price information. So, um, or maybe don't even have that information. It's not always known. And so currently, those, those concepts don't exist in the CRM. So our data analyst is working with um, ICOM to extend the CRM to represent price information. And um, we assume there will be other other fields not represent the CRM, which will require creating ontology staff with other existing ontologies or extending and building out our kind of custom ontology to um, represent those concepts we can't possess, uh, represent in existing ontologies. It seems to be uh, a trend. But we're kind of just early on right now just working with the CRM and pushing it as far as we can with our data. So furthermore, our data can, is ambiguous and complex. Prices are recorded in the stock with data, but they're not always clear. They're not always just one price. Oftentimes, there's shared sales between dealers, coded sales, or multiple currencies. So expressing these nuances remains to be um, resolved. Another component of the project will be to reconcile our local authorities and control lists with external vocabulary, such as the Getty vocabularies. There are values that are currently populated by local authorities, but can be linked to URIs from the union list of artist names for the AAT. There's also location values that weren't included in this uh, sample mapping that could be linked to TGN. 
So at the very least, we're interested in linking to the, the actors involved in the transfer and also the, the creator and also the, the competing type. But there's, um, we still need to resolve exactly how that reconcil reconciliation will um, be represented in terms of how much we'll rely still on our local um, authorities versus relying solely on the getting vocabulary store authorities. The project also hopes to exploit semantic knowledge organization systems for data enrichment to provide more information where there are gaps in the data. And in addition to, um, we're exploring how the vocabularies can be effectively incorporated into information architecture to enhance search and retrieval, such as multilingual search, which could involve dereferencing alternate, alternate labels from concept URIs, such as Europeana has done. Other possibilities include term suggestion, exploratory or relationship searching, aiding in visual representations of provenance data, and facilitating browsing and searching across data sets potentially. But that's all to be, to be explored. So in conclusion, I could see there is um, cultural heritage information is unique in some ways in terms of um, how heterogeneous the material is and how ambiguous it can be. It's contextual. It's um, changing over time. Knowledge organization systems have helped to kind of mitigate some of those issues. And the semantic web promises to, to create a linked um, ecosystem, network ecosystem, and semantic uh, knowledge organization systems really have an opportunity to kind of help facilitate that, that linking. Um, although there's a lot that remains to um, be seen in terms of what that will actually translate to. I think we're at a moment now where we're just tra we're trying to uh, translate and expose our data and really what that'll mean um, on the other end for users is to be seen. Um, but we're hoping with the Provenance Index project that we can provide a kind of case study on, on exploiting the vocabularies in new ways, both um, as authorities, but also for search and retrieval and the new uh, information system that we develop, um, in addition to creating a resource for scholars and our historians to um, be able to um, do their kind of existing or traditional modes of uh, research, but also explore kind of computational analysis and mm -hmm. other types of um, network analysis in uh, the fields of provenance and our market research. That's about it. <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Discuss this in a very tiny bit of it. And I don't understand any of the technical stuff, so I'm not going to go into it. Do any of the vocabularies that you use? That um, the GRI do they ever deal with ugness or about this? Do you ever get into that muddy water? So the vocabularies would be the terminology for, for for describing what you're discussing, but um there is a fourth vocabulary that, that the Gitty Vocabularies is developing right now. They've been developing for several years, it's called the Cultural Object Name Authority. Um, there aren't a lot of um, records in there right now. And they're currently mapping that to see our as well, if it's um, sort of in progress. But that, um, and Kona, it's, it's the um, Cultural Object Name Authority, it's also called Kona, and it's built off CDWA. And CDWA does um, try to structure subject indexing and try to kind of break apart those nuances in terms of is the subject depicting what it is versus what it's about versus right. what it's of. Um, there are display fields for subjects and also indexing terms, and then there's um, control there's control lists that will actually help you clarify what what is the subject term actually representing. So it's trying to provide more information, but I don't see that. I don't think that's widely used in the museum community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just thought of it when you had Monet Monet's family in the garden by Manny. Yeah, because then I mean Monet is enough that he's already in the. the mm -hmm that list of artist names and stuff, so I just... Yeah, like how would you, how would you yeah, find how Monet? Would you yeah, put all that together? And I, I know that's a mess, but I was just curious. As yeah, and I mean, right now you would only find Monet if you searched the, the type, if the title was, you know, mixed right. at this point. But I know in um, CWA and in Kona, 
we can pull in subject terms that would include you know, generic conceptual ideas, but also proper names. So in Kona, it actually links to the three other vocabularies. So you can pull subject terms from TGNs, so place names, place locations, um, personal names, or these kind of more conceptual ideas. So in, in that case, you could actually index Monet, plot Monet, and then say it would be depicts or what I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. but you can actually and then that you know, the structure is encoded, encoded there. So potentially you could use use the the ULAN record to kind of to kind of um, you could utilize the variant terminology there and also expand your search too. And that that can be complicated when you you don't want to create too many search results or you know, yeah. But um, so is doing that, it's kind of trying to... Yeah, so CDWA, which is a metadata scheme that was built for, to, try to, to meet with the complexity, or to try to resolve some of the complexity or represent the complexity of cultural heritage metadata, and Kona was built off that, mm -hmm. but it's also structured like a thesaurus, so it includes um, multiple uh, titles, and you can, you can um, catalog what type of title it is, the dates of the title. So it, tr it tries to give more context to the work, maybe outside of what a museum record might have. But uh, right now it's, it's in transition where they're building up the records. And it's also in transition because of the, the this linked open data project where they're wanting to, to express it as CDOC and expose it to kind of see what potential use, use cases might be for that at the same time. But it, you, it is available on the GitHub website, so you can look at the structure. Go back to the previous slide. This one? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is maybe more of a comment, but it's interesting that we, we have uh, um, an event for acquisitions, two acquisitions, right? Mm -hmm. um, but not an event for um, period of ownership, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. this was a very preliminary mapping. So you could actually, mm -hmm. you would map in addition to that, depending mm -hmm. on the. It, it's also the data that you have. So. We don't know the period of ownership that he had because the, we only have the data that's encoded. But you right. could in, you could encode um, a property that says was former owner and link that back to the object. Well, the, the other thing I was thinking yeah. is you may not need that because you can infer that from the relationship, right? The, you can infer, yeah, some. Um, but at the same time, because of something like um, the ambiguity of when Ulrich acquired it, you may also want to record that in that event of ownership, like beginning mm -hmm. unknown or something. Right, like right. That. Um, but, so that's what I was looking at that. I, I wasn't sure if you had that um, possibility to encode that or to record that as well, but like, uh, yeah, it's just, just a comment. No, no, it, it's, it's, really, it's important and I think those questions are going to come about as we can do mapping. It's sort of how much how much context can you mm -hmm. encode in the data, and how much of that are you is found in it, and how much are you inferring? Or and yeah, because I think I, well, I think with, it's interesting about the Ulrich thing because it's like you do on some level want to encode that ambiguity, mm -hmm. um, because the ambiguity may not be able to be inferred. You can infer, um, you know, was acquired at such and such a right. date, and was acquired at such mm -hmm. and such a date, so we can infer that obviously. Um, and Will Blair and Company owned it at yeah. this date, um, but if you don't know those that information, then I don't. Yeah, obviously you can't infer it necessarily. Right, right. And I know, like, with there's there's another provenance project that's trying to structure provenance information for museums as as linked data. It's called Art Tracks. Okay. Um, and traditionally, museums record provenance as sort of a kind of free text field, descriptive field. Not narrative, but it really is just kind of a single single field. And so um, they're developing uh, an application that's able to parse that data and structure data, and then they're mapping. I think they've created their own ontology, but they are interested in some point linking to um, to uh, CDOC CRM as well. And what's interesting there is with provenance data, it's sometimes like we have we know that it was these two dates because we have this archival document that says that. But in some cases, you only know maybe someone you have a an inventory that says, oh, I know this baron owned this painting in 1882, I guess like 1782, but I don't know, and then I know it appeared in this collection 15 years later, but I don't have anything that says the moment right. in which this transferred, so how do you encode the more vague data? And I yeah. know that 
at least the time data. And I know that um, with CDOC you can do outer and inner dates that help you encode that fuzziness, but mm -hmm. that's a lot, I think, manual, not manual, but it's not, it's not existing in the data already necessarily. Yeah. Like usually we have qualifiers and we just be like, like the like 1964 question mark or before 1964 and and that gets really yeah well and that's I mean that's interesting with the the LC extended the time format that you can have that in there but I think what I know presently when you encode that data within some sort of a system something like a questionable date you have to spell it out like you still have to spell out the time frame yeah, that, yeah, that yes. you're questioning yeah. it because it doesn't dates are really Messy. Yeah, and I know like um, in CW, CDWA and Kona, you, it, it also, you can index the, that ambiguity in the data where you have an earliest and latest date, mm -hmm. and you're just kind of guessing in yeah, some yeah. way, and same thing with artists, birth dates and death dates, like you can see when an artist was active and you know when they died, so you can assume when you're indexing the birth date that well, they couldn't have lived for 200 years, yeah, so yeah. You, can, you can help, at least that helps with, um, with search and retrieval, but you still are making assumptions and inferences. But Melissa, I'm very interested in uh, what I would call workflow. Um, I mean, I work with the CRM. I'm part of its mm -hmm. SIG, and it's an incredibly complex ontology. And these things are beautiful, but how much of this is uh, manual and how much of it is automatic? How do you Oh, in terms of the actual mapping, yeah, so that's we're working on that now. Our data analyst is working with um, he's working with 3M right now, but she's also worked with Karma, and and I think it is a balance of the two. Where I know Karma will, if you if you ingest the data, it will start to suggest um, properties and classes to move mm -hmm. to, but. Sometimes it's making, at least when we worked with it a year ago, it's making assumptions that aren't actually true in the data. So I think some of that can be automated in terms of, you know, you know and most likely if you have a production, you're going to have a, an actor related to that and you're going to have a time span, but you still need a human there to go through and, and make sure that you're actually recommending <coughs> what that field is. And um, I. I imagine with the more granular or specific data to a data set that a system isn't going to be able to do that. So it, it is very labor intensive and it's, um, it's also very iterative. There's one pass at it and then there's this collaborative aspect where you're getting feedback by both. Um, like our data analyst works a lot with the production, uh, the, the editorial team because they know the data very well from, from the source material so they have input She's working closely with the CDOC folks to so make sure that she's using the relaying the ontology right. Also working with other um, uh, cultural heritage information professionals to, to see how they're mapping. So it's this very collaborative, iterative process. It's incredibly time consuming. Um, so for each one of these actors, mm -hmm. like, it would be like a link that you could click on and then it would conceivably show you all the transactions that they were involved in? Or Potentially, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the sense is that you're using the same, and that's where the, the authorities come in, but yeah, that you, you build the UI on top of that, that you could conceivably get every, well, with no other VLOX, that's what the, the archive is, but you know, <coughs> Alberta or if you'd be able to pull every object that this, mm -hmm. this person owned and potentially with especially more historical figures. Um, I mean, we have data from these archival inventories and the mm -hmm. sales catalogs, so you potentially could search, say, what Marie Tan Antoinette owned over a period of time pulling from these different resources when all the data is modeled and structured mm -hmm. the same way. Yeah, I see how that's great for like information retrieval. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm really interested in what you're talking about, like the analysis aspect. So if these are a bunch of links, like would you be willing to like provide the actual like data set? Like would you be able to just hand over like the big data to people? <laughs> yeah, to yeah. users? Like, so there'll be um, there'll be kind of multiple ways that the data can be mm -hmm. both um, searched and also um, accessed. So mm -hmm. there'll be um, the UIs, and then yeah, it's either using the API or endpoint they were mm -hmm. able to download um, as in various um, RDF formats. But also, I am actually not sure. I mean, probably CSV. We want to be able yeah. to provide it in kind of more raw format so people yeah. can use it as they want. But then you, there's definitely the kind of maintenance aspect of yeah. that. You've got to then maintain all those different formats. So I think we're doing user interviews right now to really get a sense of what scholars need and use, right. and that will kind of help inform the formats in which we data. Are the, sorry, are the, um, 
like the geographical locations actually like spatially linked? Like if you were to put it into like a mapping software, would it know where the... So that's a good question. <laughs> um, in our existing data, no. But that's where we're hoping the vocabulary can come in because um, the uh, TGN does include spa geospatial coordinates. Okay. And right now, I know they're um, ingesting terms from geomames, which doesn't which okay. does include spatial coordinates. So they're working country by country. I don't know how long they are. It's a big process yeah. to ingest the world. But um, um, so that, that would be a potential in being able to re-reference that, that um, information and, and use that in visualization. So that's, cool. that's our hope. It's a lot of unknown and sort of what we would hope. And it's always the way you hope and then the reality is something in between. <laughs> does the TGN, um, people that are working on that, do they offer like GIS data to people at all for any of their? TGN, you can, yeah, you can query TGN now through Spark yeah. 1.0 and oh, gather great. if there if there is geospatial data present in the, yeah. in the concept news. One of the issues that you mentioned that I found particularly interesting was in uh, populating this uh, uh, provenance index, the question that came up, what were you trying to model mm -hmm. the uh, source and document itself or the events themselves? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the context in which that it came up, and maybe yeah. one instance that you guys were able to resolve. Well, that's we're currently in, that's a kind of in, intermediary issue right now. So um, it came up in with it was it came up in looking at preliminary mapping um, of the sales catalog database with our editorial staff and the, the head of the department because. Right now, my understanding is in the Providence Index, they transcribe um, records from these primary source documents, but they're already enriching those document or the, that information after they transcribe the source material by adding authority names. They also cross-reference with other resources, and that's great. But then it goes back to the modeling. Like, for example, if you're going to say this acquisition was related to this object, but it's also found in the source material you could be inferring that all of this information also came mm -hmm. from that source material. And that's maybe not true, because maybe we know this um, this person sold this, but maybe, so so it, it kind of, it lends back to the structure of the, the archival documents. Right. And I'm most familiar with the, with the stock book projects. I worked a little bit on it, but you have what's in the stock books, but you have basically a suite or, or kind of collection of archival documents that sort of represent this gallery's um, activities. So you have stock books, but you also have sales books that also include information about the owner and and other kind of more detailed information. So some of this data has been enriched by both those those source materials, and that can become difficult to map when you may not know where that information came from, or you do, and then you have to start doing it becomes you can't, it's less generic and it becomes more custom specific based on the particular information and that's a challenge so that does go back to are we document are we mapping what's only found in the in the in the source document as a as a record of the document or are we more interested in this event right this mm -hmm. sale of this object at this particular time and whatever information or what data is present is included in that mapping and I don't think we have answered that question right. yet but, yeah, but it's important because it affects um, a lot of decisions that are made. Is there, are, it, is there uh, <clears throat> any feature, are there any features in the data store that would allow you to track the provenance of these uh, facts mm -hmm. um, uh, rather than the works of art? So that uh, perhaps you, uh, if you have the, the ability, for instance, to record uh, conflicting facts from uh, mm -hmm. more than one source. Um, and that is a great question and something that we've been talking about. Um, we had a um, workshop when we brought scholars in who are using this data and had several um, scholars say, oh, I find something in Providence Index, and then I find something somewhere else that says this, and I know this is correct. Mm -hmm. And it opens up that same question of what is this 
what is the state of representing? Are we trying to find the most um, truthful, the kind of comprehensive representation of this moment in time, or are we really rooted in that mm -hmm. the, um, resource? And that's something that's on our radar too, in terms of what, what we'll, we need to make. I think you have to decide what you're modeling, and then from there, if we do um, want to represent data outside of the source document, how do you um, encode that, the, the conflicting, conflicting data? So these are all good questions. Re reaffirming all the questions that we're asking. Just to comment a little bit on that, because I have a small amount of familiarity okay. with some of the other vocabularies and that type of um, provenance or technical metadata. I mean, as far as triples go, you need to have a whole other structure for that as well. And that is taken um, part of in that, in, in say, PGN. You know, they record, like, who recorded this or who made yeah, this yeah, decision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but as for sources, I think they, they record some of that as well. Um, yeah, they do, yeah. So, they... But I don't know how far back it goes. It's, sure, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was legacy data. I know, so, in all the vocabularies, there are source, sources for the terminology, for the so you have your concept record. Each term has a source or multiple sources. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are sources for the, the description or the entire record. So for ULAM, that would be the biographical information, the birth dates, death dates. So you can actually point to where that particular name was found and the number of sources, but you can also find um, um, like where the biographical information came from, because it may be from different places. So they, the, the data is structured to represent that. but. That hasn't been encoded in this, and so that's a question of do we build that out, and then we'll, we're going to have to populate information if we don't have it. So it's like there are a lot of implications on how we do the mapping and um, what data then is missing from that, sort of what do you have versus what would you like to, to have. Yeah, that's what fascinates me about projects like this, because like if you were to write a paper about this, like you could include in all this text, like, oh, well, some sources say this and some sources say mm -hmm. this, and so it's like how do you boil down this really like nuanced stuff into like structured format kind of it's, right. like, crunchable. And you know, our, our the, I would say the primary um, audience for this are art are, are historian scholars, um, also cur curators, museum curators. Mm -hmm. And the source material is so important to that work. You want to make sure you have a warrant that says this happened at this moment in mm -hmm. time. Even if there's ambiguity there, it's always tying back to, to source and citations. And so um, <coughs> it can be difficult when you're trying to enrich Really rich your data, but you're trying to reconcile what, what's found in, in the source documents as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I introduced the Getty vocabularies in a couple of my classes, but uh, concerning the issue of multilinguality, mm -hmm. when I scan the records, it looks like it's limited to a pretty small number, including German and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Dutch. So I'm wondering, uh, is it it's maybe some French too? But is there a plan? I mean, how did that come to be? Why those specific languages and why not other specific mm -hmm. ones? I think, I think I can speak to that. My understanding is it's based on partnerships. So they partner with, with mm -hmm. um, other oh, institutions. Oh, I so um, I know they've worked with the academics on mm -hmm. the uh, Chinese translation and RDK mm -hmm. on the Dutch translation. And I don't know who they're working with in, for the German translation, but they work with a mm -hmm. with an institution. So it's sort of, they meet someone uh, and someone offers, because it's, it's very time consuming mm -hmm. to do yeah. um, comprehensive translation. And there are, in addition to translating terms, there's conceptual shifts that happen. And, and, shifts that happen in the facets when you're introducing terminology that maybe isn't represented in one language but is represented in another. So it's not just translating the text, it's, it's it shifts the kind of the conceptual organization of A. This is for AAT. So AAT is the only yeah. vocabulary that we have these, these large translation projects going on. Um, there are some French terms and I think that's based on contributions. A lot of the mm -hmm. content development for vocabularies is based on contrib contributor data. So but then it's edited and vetted by, vetted by um, editorial staff. So I know in ULAN there's some um, multilingual terms, but that's really being pulled from other, other sources. Okay, okay thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you so much. Yeah.